Hello, everybody. Woo. Woo. That's a long day, right? Uh, so that's the, not the last one, but just the before the last one, <laughs> session of the day. I uh, hope you're all well. And to start, I have one disclaimer and two questions for you. The first disclaimer is, ADB is boring. You must know that, really. It's totally boring. So everything I will tell you is boring, but we will try to make fun with all this, okay? Now I have two questions. My first question is, who is an, uh, an Android developer in the room? Okay, so right now, uh, raise your hand and keep it up if you are an Android developer. If you are not, you can just go away from this uh, room. <laughs> uh, okay, and who thinks he is a massive ADB user? Okay. You are wrong, guys. <laughs> you are wrong. No, no. Uh, you'll see, and I will try to show you during this conference. Actually, you are all, because you are all Android developer, almost, sorry. <laughs> you are all big ADB users. And many, on many ways that you maybe never notice. Okay? We'll see that. So this talk is about ADB, how it's built from inside, and how you use it every day. And how other tools are using it. So my name is Eyal. Uh, I'm uh, from Paris here, and I'm happy to be a, a, an organizer of this event, a co-organizer. So if you have any problem, just let me know. No worries. But after this talk, please. Uh, I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert, which is a, a um, uh, sorry, a program at Google helping speakers to speak. Uh, if you want to find me on the net. Uh, you can have all the links to this thing. I'm working at Canto, uh, which is a, a kind of bank <laughs> in France, and uh, uh, we are recruiting no Android developers, <laughs> but if you work on backend and things like that, feel free to just come to me so we can just discuss. So if you want the slides, they are on this link, bit.ly slash chill. And there is this link at the end of the slides here, so no worries. Okay, uh, so of the agenda of this, of, this, of this talk. First, we will um, discuss about how ADB is working. That's the big picture. Uh, I will show you some ADB commands that are pretty interesting on many, many uh, situations. Uh, some ADB internals. So now we will go deeper on the Android uh, uh, system and how it's working. Uh, and then we will see how, if you want to contribute to ADB, how you can do it. What's the first steps and, and uh, what would be interesting to do. And then we will finish on how your Android developer tools are using ADB. Let's start. So first, ADB stands for the Android Debug Bridge. It's a command line tool and it allows you as a developer to communicate with any kind of Android device. You, oh yeah, these, device can, these devices can be physical, also physical devices, or emulators, of course. Uh, it's part of the platform tools from the SDK. Okay, if you go to the platform tool of the directory, you will find this binary. And uh, it used to be, I think it's not anymore, because I didn't see that for many months now, uh, you have a stable and a preview uh, channel from the SDK manager that you can choose. Okay. Now, how ADB is working. So, you have three elements, like the trinity of ADB. You have the ADB client, the ADB server, and the ADB team. The ADB client is actually the command line that you are running when you are typing ADB. Who already typed in the console uh, ADB something? Raise your hand. Okay, almost everybody, so you've done that. And actually, when you do that, you are calling and you are using the ADB client. You are instantiating the ADB client. On the other side, you have the ADB daemon. The ADB daemon is running on your devices. All every, uh, all, every Android devices uh, is running an ADB daemon. Sorry, it's not an English but a sentence, but you will get used to it during the talk. Uh, so it's a process, it's a background process that is started uh, at the boot of the system. And the role of this daemon is to execute 
the command that you ask to the device directly on the device. And the third element I wanted to tell you about is the ADB server. Actually, the ADB server is the real bridge of the Android debug bridge because it will link the ADB daemon and the ADB client. Okay, let's take a practical case. <coughs> you are using your ADB client. What this ADB client do when you are just talking it? It will check if there is an ADB server. If there is not, it will launch one. What this ADB server is doing when it just uh, is just to work up, it will open a TCP server on this port 5037. Uh, and then the next thing it will do is to scan for Android devices or emulators. Uh, the way it does that, you have here the uh, uh, for, for the network path, for example, for the UT emulator. Uh, you have the localhost interface, so the localhost network interface of your uh, uh, computer, and it will actually crawl ports and check if there is an Android, an Android emulator behind that. So it will just check on the first port, which is the 5555, if there is an emulator, and do that for the other one. And what you notice here is that it's only checking for odd numbers, un pair for French people. <laughs> Uh, on numbers, why? Because when you are launching an emulator, uh, it, this emulator will open all, all, all the time two TCP servers. One is for ADB, in this case for the first one is 5555, and another is a serial uh, communication thing that nobody uses. And it, it will be on the port 44, oh, sorry, 5555 port. There is one more file that we need, but anyway, you get it, right? So that's the way the ADB server will detect automatically emulators that are running on your device. When you are running on the emulator, you see that directly on ADB devices, right? That's exactly because uh, uh, of this. So when it detects that there is an ADB daemon behind, so a device, it will just establish the connection. And then you can use ADB to communicate with the device. That's exactly the same for the USB interface, so let's make it quick. Uh, it will, on Linux, for example, it will crawl all the USB interfaces, looking for the, exactly the same thing, almost. And uh, for uh, Mac and Linux, uh, there are some triggers, okay? I won't go into too much detail because that's more boring than the boring part of my ADB. So finally, when you are plugging several devices, you can have this situation, for example, you have a Android Studio emulator that is connected to your ADB server. You can have also this example, Nexus 6P, or a network device. A network device can be a physical device uh, um, connected through the network, we'll see that later, or also a Genymotion device. Genymotion device are network devices. I tell that to all the three Genymotion guys in pink that you have in front of in the front row. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so let's see some ADB commands. Um, I, told, I told you before, network devices, you can use uh, the network to uh, connect through ADB, right? You can do that on physical devices very easily. You plug them to USB, and then you type this command, ADB TCP, giving a port. By default, it's the 5555, you know the, the thing that we've seen before? On the free, you, you remember? the range, right? Uh, and then, once you configure your device, you can just unplug it uh, from USB, and then launch ADV Connect with the local IP of the device. <coughs> Sorry. And it will enable the wireless debugging. If you want to disable it, just type ADV USB, and it's done. Okay. Now, let's try to just go a little bit deeper into the ADB TCP IP command. So when you are typing this command, what's happening on the device? Okay, the ADB server will ask to the daemon to enable the network connection. So what it does actually, it's, it will send this kind of payload, okay, TCP IP, column, and 5555, the port that you typed. Pretty straightforward. Then the daemon, it will take this uh, port, the, you know, the, the number behind the column, 
and it will set a system property. You can do the same thing using set prop uh, when you are do using a shell. And the name of the property is very long and boring, like all the things in ADB. Service ADB TCP port. Okay. Then, what the ADB demon is just closing itself. It just suicide itself. So, no demon anymore. No ADB running on the device. And that's all. Yeah, goodbye. You can, the talk is finished, right? No, actually, there is something magic. Not really magic, actually. Uh, but the ADB daemon is declared on the init.rc, which is something a very Unreal OS thing, uh, uh, as a service. And this service is uh, maintained by the OS itself. So when the ADB is killing itself, the system will say, hey, yeah, there is no ADB daemon anymore. Let's relaunch it. And what the daemon will do when it will be reversed, it will check for the property it previously set. And at start, it will be able to open the network server uh, that uh, uh, is handled behind this property. Okay, interesting, right? But who, who does really care? That? And what can you learn from that? Except that it's really complica complicated and not really interesting. I know. The only thing I wanted to show you is that actually, when you are doing an ADB TCP IP uh, and, and the port number, uh, you can do it by yourself. If you have a root access on a device, you could do it by opening a shell, then doing set prop with this very long and boring property, 5555, and then you stop the ADB and start it again. But the cool thing is that actually, if Instead of service ADB TCP port, you type set prop persist ADB TCP port. This property will remain after reboot. And this is totally not documented, right? So if you have some kind of device farms or device that can be debugged on wireless in your company and you want that everybody can access them very easily, even after a reboot, you can just do it once you have the root access on the device. Okay, another cool thing, uh, if you are typing ADB devices dash L, you will have more information than the simple ADB devices. So sometimes you need, for example, when you are automating a lot of things in your company, and you want more information than just this very strange uh, uh, serial number, just add the option dash L and you will have many other information. Here you have on the first line a Jenny motion device. On the second line you can tell that it's an Asus, uh, Asus and that's a Nexus 9 on the third line. So you see? So if you are scripting a little bit and you want to discover the devices connected to your uh, uh, script, just parse the output of this and you will know everything. Uh, another good thing, I will be very quick on that because it's not really useful, but you see that it will come later in the, in the talk. Uh, you have some filters that you can apply to, uh, um, to an ADB command. With DH E or DH D, you can target only emulators or network devices or only USB devices with DH A and DH D. Other options, and these can be quite interesting when you are again doing some kind of a cloud automation, thing like that. Um, dash H and dash P. They allow, you, uh, they allow you to target remote ADB servers running somewhere on the web. For example, I type ADB dash H with an IP and then a port devices. And I will try to fetch and to list all the devices running from for example, this IP, this IP is actually the, the IP of the device farm of my, of my company. So I have my client that will contact, the, my ADB client, will contact this, this, this device farm server hosted in my company. And this device farm is linked to all these devices. And I will have all these devices available locally for me to launch, for example, my script or anything I want, just because of these small options. Okay, uh, ADB reverse. 
All the comments. Does anybody know ADB forward? Raise your hand if you know that. Just a few, of course, the emotion guys, except the sound man. What are you doing here, man? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I miss you too, man. <laughs> no, uh, um, what I was saying, yeah, ADB forward. So basically, ADB forward, do the reverse of ADB reverse. Is it simple, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, good example for ADB forward. When you are developing, sometimes you are debugging, right? So, from your Android studio, you are in touch with your application running, and you can debug. So, if you put a breakpoint on, on Android studio, the application will stop until you just release the breakpoint, right? And actually, it's done through an ADB forward. So, you have a server on the device, and ADB is doing a bridge between a TCP client and a TCP server there. Nobody understood, me neither. Let's switch to ADB reverse. So this is the situation. For example, I have my application uh, that wants to access uh, a remote server, but the address that it will define is localhost with this port number. And on the other side, I have my uh, computer running a server locally on this port. And what ADB Reverse is doing is actually binding when you are typing ADB Reverse TCP this number and then this number. Yeah, I hate numbers in English, I'm sorry. Uh, it will bind these two connections. And seamlessly, your device will access your computer very, very simply. So this is a simple example. But here is another example when it can be really, really good. This situation. You have your computer. Uh, this computer is connected to a VPN to access a secure staging backend, for example. That's pretty simple and pretty uh, uh, um, uh, common use case. And what you will be able to do with ADB Reverse is to, is to make your application contact directly your secure backend server behind the VPN through your computer. And you can ask ADB to do it for you. Actually, what you must do is very simple. Open, uh, set the proxy, the local proxy, on a setting that I will show you just later. You open, you, you start a proxy on your computer, and you will, and, and ADB reverse will just link the both proxy settings here, and your proxy server here, and then because, because you are a proxy, your computer will be able to send all the requests to the good backend. Uh, how you can do that? Don't try to recall this, okay? Go back to the slide for that. But what I'm doing here is just in three shell commands, you can just do what I, what I show you. You can start a squid server locally, and this squid server will be running on this port, 3128, uh, which is the default script, uh, uh, server uh, port, sorry. And then with ADB shell, you will put the HTTP proxy of the whole Android device to local local 3333. And then with ADB reverse, you will bind the squid server to the local proxy, and then it's straightforward. Every request that you will send to this. Uh, to your uh, backend will go through your computer, through ADB, and then through the VPN to the backend. Okay, that was boring, right? But sometimes useful for very specific use case. That's what I wanted to show you. And just to finish all these weird comments that can be very useful on specific topics, I want to tell you about one last comment. So, uh, this is ADB. What do you see this command is doing? Oh, tricky question. <laughs> yeah, it displays the help, the usage. You can call every, uh, uh, all, all, the, all the way you want. Yeah, it displays the help. That's exactly what I wanted to show you. And what I will show you is not anymore in any, but it has been uh, removed something like a little bit more than one year ago. But it has been on the ADB uh, binary 
for more than eight years. So I really wanted to show you. So on this L, there is this part here. You have an option that I didn't tell about because it's really uh, Android OS centric, uh, which is dash P. And you, if you read the first line, you will see simple product name like Sooner. And when I've seen that, I said, no, oh, Sooner, Sooner, what's this device? Who knows the Sooner? Nobody? All the time when I ask this question, the only guy that is ready in their hand is the old guy from Google. And only. Okay, so what is the sooner? This is the sooner. So that's the very, very first Android phone that have never been designed, and it has never been released. Actually, it has been dropped before uh, uh, the, the 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 first Android released. <coughs> the story is that uh, you know that all these things are always controversial, you know. But uh, so it, there are many versions. I will tell a mashup just to make fun. Uh, but what was happening? The Android OS was not enough stable, but they were supposed to release Android the very first 1.0 with this device. But they they have been pretty late. So the, the hardware of this device has been kind of uh, outdated. So they decided to drop it to choose another hardware, which was the HTC G1, that all the old people in, the, in this room maybe know. Uh, so, uh, yeah. That thing, this is the Andrew's Rubin uh, uh, reaction when he just seen the iOS first uh, uh, keynote announcement. Holy crap, I guess we are not going to shoot that phone. That phone was the sooner. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> it's a nice slide that I can show to everybody now. Okay, so we make fun, yeah. Okay, let's go back to internals. Again, it will be boring, but it will end up with a funny thing, okay? And that's the only reason why I show you boring things. The ADB internals. So, you know, we have this ADB client, ADB server, and ADB daemon. And actually, all these elements are communicating uh, between each other. And each portion is way, uh, is link, uh, each link, sorry, has its own protocol behind that. So let's see a little bit what are these protocols. Very, very uh, quickly, okay? If you are typing a shell ls, what's happening uh, between the client and the server? So you have the ADB client that will ask to the ADB server, what's your protocol version? And then the ADB server, okay, yeah, it will send this payload, host, the column version. Then the ADB server will answer, this is, my, my version is 36. On this example, of course. Uh, then, what you will do, it will tell, okay, ADB server, now I want to tell, to discuss with every kind of devices. And then yeah, the ADB server will say, okay, that's fine. And finally, the ADB client will send the real execution, the real uh, request you want the ADB server to, to execute. And in, in this case, it's shell, colon, ls, so shell for the service shell, and ls, which is the parameter that we passed, okay? And the ADB server will execute an ls at the root file system, and just listing all the folders that you maybe already know, okay? So pretty, pretty simple. So what we can uh, understand from that, and that's true for all the communication between them, you always have three phases. Then first you have the startup, so they, they will uh, check the version. Then you have the device selection, and then you have the service execution. Service execution is really what you aim when you are a developer. Uh, okay, this is learning, uh, it, it's, Sorry, this helps us to just understand something interesting. You see that there is a check version. And sometimes when you are using ADB, I don't know if it happens to everybody, uh, but you can have this kind of error message. So when you are typing simply ADB devices, you will have ADB server version 32, 32 doesn't match this client, uh, ADB server, server is out of date. It's because of this, actually. 
because you have a check version. So most of the time when you have this kind of error, it means that you have a server and you have a, a client that is not the same version. So basically not binary at the first uh, glance. And, uh, and there is a mismatch. So you must find the mismatch. I won't solve your problem, but now you know why, okay? And uh, yeah, uh, another thing which is uh, pretty interesting is that when you are typing ADB with just three command, you have this uh, uh, selection that is done, any. And the filters I told you before, actually on the selection you have a specific payload, don't just focus on this because it's really protocol ish, it's really not interesting. But you see that there is a, a sentence sent exactly to select the device uh, 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 on the protocol. Uh, yeah, so basically, the ADB client is aimed to just receive your request and uh, ask to a service to be executed. You have an ADB server which will execute what is called host services, and you have, oh, sorry, the daemon which execute, that will execute other kind of uh, uh, services that, is, that are called local services. Okay, good. Here is a list, another boring list <laughs> of services. Uh, this is the host services, nothing interesting, but let's take just a small look at the local services. So this, this line is not for you right now, it's more like if you want to read it later, to just learn it a, little, uh, a few more things. But what I wanted to show you are just these two lines. The first service is JDWP. JDWP is the protocol used by Android Studio to debug your, your, your application. So when you are using the debugger, they are using exactly this protocol. And the other thing is sync, which embed its own other protocol inside it. It's really an uh, inception thing. Uh, uh, and it, the, the sync is used for push and pull. So you see, everything in ADB is bundled, is defined by a protocol. And it's pretty complicated. But we don't really care, right? So let's move on. Server demon. Other, uh, other kind of uh, uh, protocol and other problems. Okay, let's look at what the message looks like. It looks like this. Yeah, I know, it's not really interesting. But when you try to feel it, it's a little bit more. Okay. You see, you have on this message a uh, header, which is a kind of structure, actually just a structure, a C structure, uh, which is called a message. And then for the rest of the payload that will be sent between the server and the daemon and on the other way, you have the data. Pretty simple, right? Okay, if we take a closer, but very quick again, only the thing that we need to the a message, you can see that this is a, a copy pass from the ADB source code. Uh, you have a comment, which is a verb of the action that they want to do, and we will see what, what it's used for. And then there are two arguments that have no real meaning. Actually, they have a meaning uh, depending on the comment uh, set. And then, and this is an interesting information, the size of the data. And the size of the data is actually the size of the blue part here. Okay. Let's take a first example. When you are doing an ADB connect with an IP and a port, what's happening? You have the ADB server that will send the first payload looking like this. So you have the command, and then you have the two arguments. The first, so the payload here is connection, so please connect. That's exactly what it says. Uh, and then the second argument, it's interesting. You, you see here is uh, two sorry, 256K, uh, it means actually th what's the maximum size of the data the ADB server is able to handle, uh, handle for each message. So actually, uh, this number is the blue part size, maximum size that the server could, could, can handle. Yeah. Uh, and on the other side, the ADB demon, it will answer with the exact same command and it will send on his side, on his, on his side too, uh, the maximum payload size. Okay, you can have it. Oh, yeah. And what it will have actually is 
this string, which is called the device identity string, and that's actually the exact same string that you can find when you are typing ADB devices dash L, I showed you before. That's exactly the same. And this uh, is really showing that the device is really communicating to you also when you are using ADB. Okay, just other example, and it will be the last one. ADB shell LS, there is something interesting to, to see. So when you are doing an ADB shell LS, uh, the ADB server will open a connection to the daemon through this command, open. Uh, and this is the, 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 you know, the, the, the ADB shell LS, so it will be transformed to shell.color LS. Okay, let's continue. ADB daemon will answer okay. Then uh, the ADB daemon will start answering to shell.color uh, shell LS message and it will use the verb write. Then the ADB server will, uh, will answer OK. And as soon as the, the daemon did not receive the OK, it will not send the next write. So then when, when it receives this OK, it send another write. And then because it finished, it send the close at the same time. And of course, the ADB server will answer OK for the write and then close for the close. OK? So you see, there is this kind of acknowledgement between the both between a right and an okay. But I don't know if you remember, it was in 2K15, um, there have been a big announcement about ADB becoming faster. Do you remember this? No? Just, yeah, I see somebody just uh, uh, 10 years. Yeah, actually, it, was, it had been done at the Henri Dev Summit, which was a Pretty big event, pretty interesting event, um, just in front of the Google Plex in Mountain View, uh, during the keynote that it had been given by Stephanie Sad Kuberstan, sorry. And uh, this girl is really, really, really important at Google. She's part of the top management. So you can understand that this is really serious, right? And so they announced ADB is now faster, and they, they introduced also the last, the new version of the ADB, uh, sorry, Android emulator. So it had been part of a big announcement. There, there were this chart, so you can see the speed improvement between uh, the, the Nexus 6, that was the a real device, and uh, the new Android Studio emulator that all, um, everybody knows now. So you see this huge improvement, and when you see that, when you see that, you can just think, hey, they're really, that, I mean, they are pushing the physical limits to uh, new boundaries, right? What's the magic that made this kind of improvement? And actually, you'll see, it's pretty simple. What they've done, actually, um, so today, when you are, you, when you are watching the, the message, the payload passing from the server to the daemon, you have this kind of payload, and the data maximum size is 256 kilobytes. Before this fix, it was 4 kilobytes. Just to show you visually what it means. If we take this, this example of a uh, true write message used to send uh, a response, to your data. For example, for a push, when you are doing a push or pull, you have a lot of writes and OK that are written. So if we take this with a 4K uh, uh, payload size, it would look like this. Just a new world, right? So they are not pushing the, the physical boundaries to, uh, uh, it, they are just fixing something that was really weird before. But uh, with a re really uh, impressive result. Okay, so we finished with all these intervals, uh, intervals that are boring, but where you can discover very final things about how they manage the project. Let's see how we can develop an enemy quickly. So, what you can do? Configure your environment, then you can fetch the source code and you can make it. That's pretty st straight, straightforward. It's really easy to work on Android. Uh, if you want to configure your environment, I put on the speaker note just a link, install everything that is uh, uh, advised there. If you are already, already built, some uh, Android OS, uh, um, it's really exactly the same story. And to get the source code and to build it, 
you can use a, a, a tool which is called a repo, which is the standard tool for, for the Android, uh, Android open source project. Then uh, uh, you target master, you fetch the source code with repo sync, configure your environment and make it. Make ADB and it's all set. Just wait a, a few, few, few minutes. It, it, it can take between 15 minutes and maybe one hour, depending on your configuration. So that, that's pretty simple, actually. And everybody can do it. Uh, and what this build will produce is two things. The first thing is the ADB client that you are using. And the other one is the ADB, D, uh, the ADB daemon that is running on the device. And these uh, both binaries are sharing a static library, which is called libADB. So these both binaries are sharing a lot of code. And when you are starting uh, uh, reading the ADB source code, can, this can lead to a, a few, uh, I would say, strange uh, code to read and, 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 and brain fuck, you know, uh, just to understand what's happening. Uh, so, yeah, you get it. You get it too. Uh, yeah, a uh, little bit of history about this project. First, it was written in C. Pretty interesting, yeah. The, it had been developed by uh, System Engine, so C is the, uh, like their favorite language, so they use this. And then they started, uh, they decided to switch to C++. So what they've done is actually they changed the compiler and they changed the source extension. And that's all. Which is not really C++. So, since this time, it was a few years ago, there, are, there is a big refactoring uh, 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 plan about the whole ADB source code to make it more object-oriented and things like that. So right now, in my opinion, when you are using the C++ uh, files on the ADB, you are more not reading a C++. You are reading something like C++, <laughs> C about++, or Another one that you can choose, C++ minus minus. I think it's the last one. <laughs> so that's something that you must know. You know, you don't feel that you will have something like real abstraction layer like we all like to do in our software. It's system engineer source code, okay? Now you know. Yeah, and the problematic behind that is also that ADB is ubiquitous. Uh, it runs, as I told you, on three different components, sharing a lot of source code, and on three platforms, Windows, Linux, and Mac. It's huge, and I can tell you that, <laughs> really. Uh, doing a, a, a multi-platform uh, desktop app is really, really uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, painful. Uh, and also, and this is maybe the most impressive thing, is that ADB server is a multiplexer. And I don't know if you already developed a multiplexer at several levels, just not only two uh, uh, levels. It's extremely complex. And the, the code that you are typing, that you are writing for, to code a multiplexer is extremely complex by nature. So uh, if you do that in C, and you don't implement abstraction layers and things like that, it's worse. So ADV source code is pretty hard to follow. It's really okay, but really to follow the source code, it's really, really painful. Uh, and all the things that you can have, uh, because it's uh, multi, uh, it is ubiquitous, you have these kind of uh, if-else in the source code. These are flags for the compiler to ignore the code uh, in, case of, in case of some uh, information. So ADB host means it's an ADB client or an ADB server. And it happens 62 times on the source code. Other example, just to check if you are running on Windows or not, it happens more than 50 times. So again, you see that more things that makes this source code pretty hard to, to follow. Uh, but there are good things. You can debug an enemy, and this can be sometimes useful for you as a user. Uh, if, you are key, if you kill the server, then export uh, the ADV underscore trace uh, uh, um, variable environment variable and set it to ADB or to all, uh, you will have more information about what's happening from inside. Uh, so ADB can server, change the environment variable and start it again. And what it will end up, 
with, you will have, if you, type, if you type ADB devices, you will have more information than what you had before. Uh, for example, here you can see host column devices, which is the service, the payload that is sent to the, to the ADB server, and other things that are completely uh, hard to, to read right now for you, of course, but uh, pretty interesting when you are dealing really with the ADB source code. And also, uh, uh, so this is for the client log, but the server is, already, is also running, uh, logging, and you have, uh, uh, so it will create some uh, files in the temporary directories. So you see Linux and Mike's Mac uh, folder and, uh, and, and, and pass. Uh, for Windows, I let you to find it, really. I didn't find it after a, a few weeks, so it's easier on Linux and Mac. Okay, so this was for the, the, the how to develop an ADB. And now the last part of our talk. I hope uh, about this talk. I hope it will be also think that you will be able to use tomorrow on your uh, daily job. So how the Android Dev Tools are using ADB. Sorry, I need to drink. It's all time? Okay, let's take five minutes. Yeah. It's pretty hot here. <laughs> okay, that's it. So, first tool, Android Studio. I have a big news for you. Oh yeah, of course, if you wonder about Android Studio, uh, if you don't know how it works, just get the source code. It's fully open source. You can have it just the same way you can have ADB source code. You get with repo, and it's on the folder tool ADE. Uh, yeah, first news for you. Android Studio does not use ADE. Uh -huh. Almost. Actually, Android Studio uses DDM Live. Do you remember DDMS? Uh, what they told uh, Roman in chat? Okay, so you see the, the bad naming. So, yeah, DDM, DDM. What is this library? What is this tool? Uh, that's a Java library, and it will behave like an ADB client. And it's also part of the AOSP. You can just download it and use it. And actually, you can also browse the source code and check how they are doing. And it's easier to read than the ADB client source code, I promise. Uh, yeah, another news for you. The DME does not use ADB. Yeah, it doesn't use the ADB. Almost. Actually, the only uh, uh, usage of ADB by DDM Lib is to start the ADB server, and only this. So the structure of the, 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 the yeah the structure that you will have is you will have your DDM Lib that will be connected through TCP to the ADB server, and of course the server is uh, like any other ADB server. Yeah, but. Question is, what's the difference between the DVM lib and the ADB binary? Actually, there are a lot, but there is one I want to tell you. Yeah. The backward compatibility. That's the main thing that makes me feel like DVM lib is really interesting for uh, many people. For example, if you take an ADB binary, it will be compatible with the very last version of uh, 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 the ADB that you launched, the reason why you have all this error on your terminal, right? Actually, DDM Lib is compatible with ADB on version 20. Only the last minor is uh, uh, to take in, in account. So, yeah, 20, it's good, right? Actually, 20 have been released on October 2008. So, you're good to go, really. It will be compatible with any ADB that you ever meet in your life. Uh, other important things, it's maintained by Google. DDM Lib is maintained by Google. It's fully open source. Uh, you have many thousands of daily users. Actually, every day you are a user, a DDM Lib user. And uh, of course, that the, the only drawback, it still needs the ADB binary to be uh, uh, able to work. So that's definitely a uh, uh, possibly good tool for you if you want to discuss with an ADB device and you are running, uh, your code is running on the G JVM, definitely think about the DMD, it's pretty, pretty nice, and many, many tools are using it. Um, 
when you are talking about Gradle plugins and things like that. Uh, ah, yeah, another thing. It's released and available on the Google My Event Sutra. And you can use it today. Like, you know, a keynote announcement. Tomorrow you will be able to use this tool. <laughs> okay, next and last tool. And I will be quick. I hope. You know I won't. <laughs> the Android Gradle plugin. This is the Gradle plugin developed by Google to make Android Studio or your build system available, uh, Gradle build system available to build APKs, right? Uh, oh, it's open source too. You can have it. Still on the AOSP repository. Again, use repo, the load the source code, and go to the tool based build system folder. Everything is open source. Yeah, the Android Gradle plugin uses DDMA. Definitely like the Android Studio. Okay, no surprise. Exactly the same context, exactly the same tool. But the question is, how does the Android Gradle plugin use DDMA? Just, yeah. Uh, actually, it uses it, and it uses it every time it has an interaction with the device. So when you're installing APK, when you are launching your instrumented tests, when you are when you want to get uh, device information, it happens sometimes when you want to start an instant run, for example. You see this pop-up appearing. Is that because you fetched the information from the device from the configuration, the, the Android uh, version, for example? So yeah, Gradle plugin will use the DNA on specific use cases. And if you want to just hack around this plugin and build some uh, thing around internal uh, uh, APIs, and I tell you it's internal APIs, it can move. Uh, you have two classes that are pretty interesting to deal with. Uh, device provider, which manage all the devices, and connected device, with, which handle a connection to a device. So you can interact with these objects that have been instantiated by the Gradle plugin and to try to have information. If you are developing, for example, your own Gradle plugin, you can interact with the Gradle plugin to manipulate the devices. Uh, yeah, another thing that is pretty interesting, uh, if you add import and import, and uh, the, if you import actually the DDM preference class, and you set the log level to this class, on your gra Gradle uh, output, if you type uh, any, any task, you give a dash dash debug option, you will have more information about what DDM lib is doing while you are running your uh, build. For example, if you are uh, doing, uh, um, sorry, uh, you are launching, launching your instrumentation tests, uh, you will see appearing these kind of lines on the, on the debug uh, output. For example, here you see that uh, there is a PM install. That's when your uh, um, Gradle plugin is installing your APK. Or what you can see here are the real comments that you can even type yourself uh, on ADV shell to start an Android uh, instrumented test. And what you see here, what you see here is the raw output of the GUnit runner and things like that of the, your test results. If you want to interact and you repipe the things, you can even just do a, a Gradle plugin or anything, just get all this information and do it the way you want. So it gives you, and also, uh, also if you have some problems, you can debug using this. You have really detailed information about what's happening between your Gradle plugin and your device. Uh, very last slide, uh, you can have Add any options from your build up Gradle, very simply. Change the timeout or also insta uh, add uh, uh, install options uh, directly uh, from, uh, um, for all your build. And very detailed, if you want to add a flag but only for specific variants, there is this API, android.testvariant.all, and it will just loop over all your variants. You see all that the product flavors, for example, of the, or the debug and release build types. And you can just have a specific behavior depending on, the, on this uh, flavor. And uh, that's all for me. <laughs> we don't have any time for questions, so uh, if you have any, I will be outside. See ya.